ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia here with another video with you all. I've been chatting with Susan in the chat. Hi Susan! I hope you're having a wonderful day. I got a, um, a request over the course of this week to do whirligig beetles. Um, whirligig beetles are this way. That way, yeah. Um, whirligig beetles are absolutely adorable, but they're one that we haven't drawn yet because they're a little bit um, on the trickier side to pick a good angle. Um, if we were to just look at it from the top, we, we couldn't tell that our whirligig beetle does actually have four eyes. These beetles, um, they sit on the edge of the water, not on the edge of the water, um, at like the surface of the water and they have two eye compound eyes that look up above the water and they have two compound eyes that look below the water and you can actually see their midline kind of where the uh, where the water surface would touch which is really cool um, so from a dorsal point of view you'd only see the two eyes from a ventral point of view you'd only see the two eyes from the bottom right um, there's a little more detail on the bottom than the top just because you've got all the legs and I was thinking we could try lateral except that all of the legs um, when these beetles are swimming they come out kind of sideways because they're more like oars they're natatorial or swimming legs um, That might be a D. Let me look it up. You know, sometimes when you know you, the word, but then, um, no, that's right, an editorial with a T. <coughs> um, this is what we call uh, swimming legs, and we're going to see really awesome swimming legs uh, when we look at the hind legs. Maybe quickie full lateral view with lots of call outs to cool fixtures. Oh, that's true. So, an idea. So we'll go ahead and we'll draw it from a lateral point of view. I'll even turn my paper side versus um, just the one. So I'll go ahead and give this to you. We're looking at a whirligig beetle. This is a family of beetles. The family is gy... oops, capitalized. Uh, gyrinity, um, gyros, because they literally just kind of spin at the water surface. Um, that's also why they're called whirligig beetles, because they spin in circles. And a lot of times you find them in clusters or in mass, just kind of spinning around each other. Um, I was kayaking one time and trying to collect these off of the top of the water at the same time. It was a lot of fun, but also um, I kept scaring them away with my kayak, and so it was actually a it was actually a more difficult feat than I expected. Actually, yeah, I'd like a dorsal view in any case because I couldn't see the skutella on my live ones. All right, we'll do all of them. We'll just we'll just see where this live stream takes us. If we get to the end of the live stream and there is a place in the beetle that we haven't seen, um, go ahead and make sure you remind me. I will try and hit all of the cool spots. Um, but I'm going to draw these sideways and I'll probably do... Maybe we just do dorsal and ventral. And then a side view of the head so you can see the cool eyes. Thank you. 
This white on black is giving my um, camera some trickiness. I think when we zoom in and there's more black in frame, then we won't have these troubles. But if we keep it at this focus for a moment, I can get you a length. From the front of the head to the back of the abdomen here, our specimen is 1.2 centimeters long. <clears throat> My cluster was about a hundred near to the shark. Pretty cool to realize they seem to be moving randomly. Yeah! I like that about them too. And sometimes I wonder if it's because the surface of the water isn't moving as strongly as the current that's underneath the surface. Um, that they have that ability to stay right there. And I have always pretty much seen them close to the shore. I don't know if I've ever seen a, a cluster of really good beetles in the center of a river or center of a stream. Uh, that's probably because there's more, like, vegetation. I, I believe they feed on vegetation. Alright. So, um, just an overall, uh, dorsal view of our friend really quick, and then we will go ahead and zoom in and draw it from the top, and then we'll flip it over and we'll draw it from the bottom. So, I'm going to start just with adding our compound eyes from the top. Um, from this point of view, they look fairly circular, but once we zoom in, I'll be able to tell you even more clearly. Um, and then, in front of the compound eyes here, there's this, um, oh, do we call this the clippius? I believe it's the clippius right here. Um, it's where the top lip connects. Uh, it's where the labrum connects. Uh, then underneath you've got the pronotum. The overall body shape of our friend here, um, the eyes are going to line up pretty much with the edge of the pronotum here. So I'm going to just start an edge from those and come out. Um, but you'll notice that they're fairly... Uh, dynamic, they're fairly, I was going to say aerodynamic, but they're not in the air, they're <laughs> swimming. Their, uh, their body shape lends to being able to zoom around the water surface very well. Alright, so we've got those taken care of, and then the widest point of our friend here is about two-thirds down the elytra. And then, he actually does kind of, the abdomen is a, a little bit longer than, the abdomen is a little bit longer than the elytra. So I ended the elytra a little bit uh, early and then added the abdomen. Hydrodynamic. I wonder if that's the word for it. Is Do you know, Susan, is that the word for it? Because hydrodynamic sounds right. Uh. All right, so at least we have the overall kind of start to our friend here. Now we can zoom into the head and see some fun features. If you say hydrodynamic, people will know you, what you mean. That's true. Aerodynamic, hydrodynamic. If you watch along the edges of this beetle as we are drawing, you'll notice that the edges are very sharp. 
and those edges are where the beetle hits the uh, hits the top of the water, which is kind of nifty. Um, so something that I am seeing here is that there almost looks like there's a little upward ridge. I'm gonna look and see what they eat because I have since forgotten. Oh, they are carnivorous. Cool. So the larvae eat other aquatic insects and the adults tend to eat insects that have accidentally fallen into the water. Um, do I know the genus species on this one? No. I wish I did. I'm sorry. There's a flange on the edge. Um, I might be able to look it up really quick. Let me see about the species that are found in the region that I collected it. So, this specimen was collected in... 2020 here in Pennsylvania over in the Poconos region. So over in like, a, it was in a river on a mountain. I think that my live stream just cut out for a moment. I hope that I'm back. There's a flange on the edge of the pronotum, too. And maybe on the elytra? Yeah, we're going to have to look. And I believe it is. Sorry, I got distracted by all the things. So I have to get, get back to drawing. Um, okay, good. I am glad that I am back. All right, this, uh, where the head connects to the pronotum, has this really, really strong wave that we can almost see from... Um, from far, far away, but I didn't have it as strong as this is. Um, you do have this flange on the edge. I'm going to move the compound eyes in towards the center of the head a little bit and probably even make them a little smaller now that I'm seeing the entire head as comparison. Um, so we're going to come on up and then... The front edge of the uh, the front edge of the head looks like it upturns a little bit, which is kind of cool. I'm gonna say that it's more shaped like this, where it comes up and arches up. And I'm leaving this little space here on the left and here on the right for the connection to the antenna. So. Um, the antenna look kind of funny because they aren't, um, the antenna look kind of funny because they aren't like long and thin or long at all, but if you see this, this little guy here, that's the antenna. It's kind of short and fat. It reminds me of, uh, you're going to laugh at me, it reminds me of like, um, like a Lord of the Rings like a dwarf or something. Yeah, kind of short. And it looks like this one is only three segments. The second segment is very, is like a really small segment in the middle. They're like fluttery eyelashes. Oh, that's funny. Um, so I'm just going to leave them kind of together like this because you can't tell the segmentation very well and then I'm just going to divide it. The first one and the third one are fairly large, but the second one in the middle is almost is thin. It almost looks like a band around the antenna, which is kind of fun. Um, then now that I've got most of this head taken care of, I'm going to go ahead and draw our compound eyes. Um, 
That little hair there makes it look like there's almost this little horn, but there is not, I promise you. Um, the compound eyes kind of fit in this space here. They don't go all the way to that edge because that edge is for the water. These eyes are trying to look up. Up, up, and away. Alrighty. Um, so one really cool view of this head I want to show you from the front. Because you mentioned it looked like eyelashes, and then it made me think of the front of the, the uh, front of, let me see, that's the labrum. It looks like it has a mustache, guys. I'm trying to get it into, perfectly into frame here. I love it so much, it's so cute. And from here, you can almost see the reflection of the second compound eyes on the bottom side of the head, right about here. Um, but you've got compound eyes on the top, here and here, our antenna. This line here is where we drew here. And this D shape that comes down, um, that's actually the upper lip or the labrum. And then those would be the CD off of the top lip. So it is kind of like having a mustache. I love it. And we'll look at it from the bottom too eventually, so I don't have to show you the bottom of that mouth really quick. Alrighty, here is the pronotum. That is a bunch of CD all clumped together. In fact, that CD when it was living was probably very, very open and separated and even across the entire space. But when aquatic insects get pinned or dry out, a lot of times their hair kind of clusters together. Alrighty, so we've got this to take care of. The uh, pronotum comes up around the edge, comes out at that same angle that this head is at. So mine is going to angle out just a little further than originally planned, but that's okay. And then um, the cross here isn't going to be straight, but kind of arched in an upwards direction, but not a whole lot, just a little bitty bit. And then I'm going to go back in here and erase any of my sketchy lines that I don't need anymore. Doop -de doop -de doop There we are. <clears throat> well, I understand why you couldn't see the scutellum. <laughs> there it is. Oh, it's so tiny. <clears throat> All right. This is one of those Dr. Bird cases. This is one of those, if you can imagine it, it's there kind of situations. Um, this is the edge where the elytra touch one another, so that's that straight line. And what we are looking at is a piece that's right about here, in between the two pairs of wings, um, like behind this pronotum here. We're looking for a thing we call the scutellum, because we <coughs> <coughs> when Susan saw it this week, she couldn't see it live, but... You almost drew a made-up scutellum. I love that. Oh, man. Oops. I'm... All right. So, it's so tiny that it's possible that it's underneath the pronotum. 
Like, maybe the elytra continue just a little bit underneath it. And that's why you, we can't, we can barely see the edge. So, if I was even going to put a scutellum in my sketch here, I wouldn't imagine myself starting from the top. I would just kind of create, like, the ittiest, bittiest little bit of a triangle up there at the top. Just to show that it does exist. It really does exist. But, um, it's so hard to see, even with a microscope, that... I can understand not being able to see it with your naked eyes. And let's go ahead and zoom in so I can show you this, um, this ridge is actually pretty clear all the way around the elytra. You can see that it kind of flattens out right here at the very edge. Ooh, it's rainbowy. I never knew that. Oh, it's so pretty! Guys, I'm excited. I had no idea that these types of colors were along the edge of the Whirligig Beetle. And there's a part of me that wonders if it has to do with blending into the reflections on the, when like the, in the ripples of the water. Remind me, is the scutellum part of the pronotum or part of the mesonotum or something else? The scutellum is kind of its own thing, but I, it kind of sits on top of the mesonotum, but it's not actually connected there. I wonder if the other side glows too. Okay, it's so pretty. Oops, gone the other wrong way. There we are. Alright, so I'm going to get the edges of my elytra taken care of here, but I'm not going to go all the way to the end because I think that there might be something special happening right here at the end rather than just meeting evenly. I think they might, <coughs> I might be putting like a rounded W down here. We'll have to see. Alright, so I'm going to pick a spot kind of in between where the scutellum would be and the edge of the pronotum where the body is actually connected and I'm going to divide it out like so. I have the approximate, this is about where I want the widest part of the, uh, of the elytra to be, but I am going to still follow this angle so it's going to look more like that, I believe. Okay. Let's zoom into the end of the elytra. Yeah, they're roundy. So instead of the elytra coming down and meeting really sharp at the end, um, they come around and they kind of curve up just a little bit. Even when they are completely closed, you're always going to have that little bit of an edge here. And I like my the one on the left better, so I'm going to try this, retry this one on the right. Doop to doop to do. Nope. 
Curly Cake Beetles were one of those um, scientific names that I never had problems with because uh, gyros means to spin. And I, um, that one was one of those that I always found a little bit easier. The same with, like, lightning bugs are lampurity. It just makes sense. So this is another series of hairs at the end of the abdomen. Um... I can't remember if whirligig beetles hold their air bubble underneath them or if they hold their air bubble under their wings. Uh, Susan, when you saw them, did you see them carrying air bubbles? All right, there are these three pieces on the end of the abdomen. I kind of want to believe that it's a female because how similar that looks to um, the female stuff on a stink bug, but I know they are not closely related at all. That's just what I want. All right, those two longer regions. All right, so that's gonna be our uh, that's gonna be our friend up here on the top. Now um, I kind of want to add the front legs because generally when you're looking at these beetles from the top, you can at least see their front legs because they have such long front legs in comparison to their middle and their middle and their hind legs. So this is what the front leg looks like. See if we can get it all in focus at the same time. It's so cool when the leg is all in one plane. Or most of it in focus at one time. So that's what I'm thinking. So if you couldn't see clear air bubbles underneath the beetles, then they were holding, what they do is they hold their oxygen or their air underneath their elytra. So they'll use these, um, they'll use these hairs, I would assume on the end of their abdomen to kind of, um, uh, I want to say absorb, but that's not the right word for it. But like, bring oxygen into their elytra. Oh, sort of like the shadows of water striders. Those are so cool too. Yeah, their spiracles have to be underneath their elytra. Um, we can, when we flip it over, we will look to see if there are spiracles on the bottom side, but I don't believe there will be. Um, alright, so, I'm gonna get rid of this word here, cause it's gonna be in the way for our legs, and the legs are more important than that, I'll write it over here. Okay. Alright, so, um, our front legs, the P part of the, these front legs, we're gonna call it about half. About half of those front legs are actually underneath because they connect right around here and then they're going to come out uh, right around here. So they're going to connect right around here and they're coming out in this direction. Sometimes with my students I've found that telling them where the leg is connected helps them get the angle properly when it's coming out of the body. Um, Alright, so this femur is of decent width here. If 
femur comes out. The tibia is narrow at the base and, and um, a little bit wider at the end. It's kind of similar to like a, um, what are those uh, like flare jeans is what I was thinking. Oh man. Alright. Alright, so it kind of flares out at the end. It looks like actually the stronger point on the flare looks like it goes towards the outside edge rather than the inside edge. Kind of like that. And then you have one, two, three, four, five tarsal segments. There were tons of water striders too. Cool. They were so wiggly. That's true. They these guys are these guys are crazy wiggly. I love that about them. Now These segments, these tarsal segments are different than all other tarsal segments we've ever drawn. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is give them a light sketch first, because I'm not sure exactly about these ones yet, but I'm thinking if we get the overall shape of them and we know what angle we want them at, I'm thinking I actually want them more forward. Let's see. No, I want them in. Yeah, that'll work. Are those lumps at the left end of the femur the coxa and trochanter, or just a part of the femur? Okay. Um, the femur goes to right here and is comes out to this point. This triangle right here is the trochanter. The coxa you can't see. Um, I'm not drawing the trochanter because it's underneath, but if you're drawing it from this perspective, that little triangle right there that is um, that comes out, it looks a little bit darker than the femur. This guy right there, that's this is the trochanter. All right, what I'm going to do, I've got one, two, three, four thin ones and a longer one. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four. Needs to be thinner. One, two, three, four. Okay. And so I've got this all subdivided out. So what I'm going to do is now draw each of them individual and make it look like they could kind of fit into one another. Because there is just a little bit of segmentation between them. And then those two claws at the end. And the series of hairs on the top. CT! And there is a part of me that wants it now to be narrower, but I'm going to make the tibia and the femur wider, see if that fixes my issue. That's better. I'm okay with that. Is Tarsus is the tarsus round or broad and flat? Let's look at the other way. I 
want to say somewhere in between ovoid or flat. Um, they're kind of flat-ish, but they are rounded like this. But then on the bottom side, they're covered in the fine CD. So it's not the top that the, the CD is coming off of. It's actually the bottom side. More canoe paddle shape. Yeah. Yeah. How cool is that? And these aren't even the swimming legs. <clears throat> I'm going to add the other leg to my sketch. I think it'll make it look more fun. Plus, we're about to move on to... Oops. We're about to move on to... Uh, the ventral. Uh, it's all right. Dorsal. What's cool is that you can see all of the mouth parts. Different leg shapes for different parts of the swimming, paddles at the front to pull you through the water, different shape of the back to propel. Oh! That makes sense. It's like the it's like the front legs kind of help them guide. I always thought that the front legs helped more with the like food collection or something. But you're right, it would make sense if it was more for like making sure you're going in the right direction. And look at those mandibles. After seeing those mandibles, you know that it has to be, it has to be predatory. Um, what I think I'm going to do instead of drawing the entire ventral, I'm just going to draw the bottom of the head because that's a really cool spot. And then the middle and the hind legs. I'm going to cheat a little bit. All right, so our head, bloop, bloop, bloop. All right, where I'm starting is right here on the edge, kind of near the eye. I'm going to come on over. The head does still connect to... Uh, in this case, it's connecting to the prosternum. Now, we're not working with the pronotum. The pronotum's on the top, the sternum's on the bottom. So the head's going to connect to the prosternum down here. And kind of comes up diagonally where the, uh, where the edges exist. Roundy, roundy. And then I'm just going to get the um, 
the estimated shape here and then I'm going to fill it in. It's how I, it's, it's how I estimate easier is if I have a, a shape to work with then, then I can kind of see if it goes above or under. So um, I'm going to be adding our eyes right around here. The eyes are pretty large on the bottom. So if you compare like this, uh, the, this size, the amount of space on the top of the head versus the amount of space on the bottom of the head, I think that the that the eyes take up more space on the bottom than on the top. And notice that they don't go all the way because you still have that little edge there, which is kind of fun. Um, there is a little bit of a straight line on the inside, but then on the outside, it's fairly roundy. The lower eyes are definitely larger, for sure. I wonder if it's just because it's darker underwater, so you kind of need more, um, need more, uh, omatidia to see. Alright, so we've got that all taken care of. Now, um, the compound eyes do have all of those. I forgot to cross hatch within the eyes on the top, but I'm not going to forget on the bottom. I want to make sure I add all these lines in here. Okay. All right, so from here, what I'm going to do is um, just come back down about a third of the eye here and then cross over because this is essentially where the head is ending and then from here forward is all mouth parts. And we're going to draw them from the bottom up. So this first one here is the labium. It's the bottom lip of, um, of our beetle, and from these edges here, it comes up and around, and then it dips kind of in the center here. Uh, there are some interesting kind of shapes and features to it. It looks almost like... It's got some kind of grooves and bends that make this shape inside of it. That's a really cool thought process. I'm not sure how the four eyes evolved. I mean, I understand why they exist, because it's an adaptation that makes a lot of sense for this beetle, but I would assume that they were swimming on the water first, and then they had two eyes, and so maybe you're right on the, um, the, the omatidae on the water's edge weren't doing anything. It's also possible that maybe being on the water's edge was damaging the eyes so then it became advantageous to have some exoskeleton some chitin there to protect them on the edge i don't know uh but i do know that up from the labium we have the max uh, out from the labium you have the maxilla and the maxilla is very tricky to see. We can't see it. But you can see the maxillary palps. This guy here and that guy there are not the antenna from the bottom. Because if we zoom out just a little bit over there to the right, you can see that one that's a little further back that's darker. Uh, that's the antenna. So this one that's a little closer up is actually existing in between the labium and the mandible connected to the maxillary. So we're going to call that 
maxillary pelk. And they may we may be only seeing one segment is what it looks like. It comes out like this. Kind of nice and wide from the edges here. Alright. And you have the mandibles here. You can see that they look pretty sharp. They're coming out right around here. And here. Mandibles. And then you have um, the labium, that upper lip, and then what's coming down are, is that like that mustache of hairs. I wonder if that's almost like a filter to keep things that they're not trying to eat away from their mandibles. Can you point out the mandibles in the image? Yes. There's one right here on the left, and there's one right here on the right. And I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit better for them. Oh, this is as zoomed in as I get. Yeah, so there are the shiny parts. This one is, that's, this is the point of this one on the right, and it comes down here, and then here, and then the one on the left starts here, and is kind of curled down a little bit further. Ah, I thought those were palps. See, I was looking for, they remind me of the centipede fangs. Oh, that's fun. I love that. centipede at work today that was so incredibly nice. I carried it around with me for a while and showed it off to guests. Alright, so that's the bottom of the head. You can see all of the cool parts. I'm happy about the head and the eyes. I'm not sure, I don't remember if we've looked at it from a lateral point of view, so we should just so that you can see Look at there is another set of palps. All right, so that's our that's our friend from the side. You can see that compound eye on the top. And the compound eye on the bottom exists right around here. Um, that's that labrum. And then we've got some palps here that I don't remember seeing from the bottom side. So I'm going to flip it over one more time so we can look. Because those look more like palps that you expect to find. And I want to know where they are connected. Those are labial palps. Oh, how cool. So you remember how I said it looked like there was something right about here on the bottom of the labium and then there was like this connecting point here and here? That, there are palps there. They appear to be three segmented, but I'm 
I'm going to say they appear to be three segmented. Right here and here. Oh! Did I hold it in my hand? Yes, I did. Yeah, they're not going to be super willing to bite a person. Um, house centipedes, where they do eat other insects, are generally more likely going to eat things that they already find dead um, rather than use their venom. Um, and it was such a nice centipede. Oh, my goodness. It was the cutest thing. And... It, um, it was just resting on my hand, and then it was, like, cleaning its antenna, and it was really cute. on these legs. There's something funny happening and I'm trying to figure it out. Sorry guys. Alright, so you have the front legs. These middle legs are wrapped around each other just a little bit, but I want to get you every segment as it exists. Just... Okay. Alright, here is what it is. This is the middle leg. Um, I'm going to be drawing the one on the left, and where the pin is coming out, you can see there is that triangular piece here. That is the coxa, spelled C-O-X-A. That's the coxa. And then when you come down, you're looking for both the trochanter and the femur, and that's what I was noticing. This is kind of funky. Normally the trochanter is pretty small, but there's this larger segment. Kind of looks like this. Um, it connects right here on this point, but then it comes out in this type of manner. That's the trochanter. It's right about here. That's the center of the trochanter, right there. Um, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and write middle legs so you know what we're talking about. Hi, Dante! Aw, thank you so much! I'm so happy you were able to make it live with us today. Let us know if you have any questions. Oops, I, that's okay. All right, so we have the coxa here. We have the uh, trochanter. And this really wide piece here that starts narrow and gets really wide, that's the femur. Yeah, that's the femur. These aquatic legs are wild. There's nothing like them. The shape of this reminds me of a scapula, like your shoulder blade. It gets really wide at the base. Keep in mind, these legs are really flat. Um, 
They help push that water. They're definitely natatorial, or those swimming legs. And the tibia is this next triangular piece here. It goes from here out. It has that little bit of wave at the end, and it does have some hairs here. So it's coming out in this direction. And funny enough, where it's connected here, um, there's enough... <clears throat> It's really close to the trochanter, the way it's bent at this angle. Um, and so it almost looks like one giant piece. But it's not, I promise. So we've got, it gets pretty nice and wide, but then there is a U shape in the center of it here. So this would be coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia. And then this is three tarsal segments. and two tarsal claws. So the first segment is here, it's wide at the base and then it comes to this point and comes back down. So that's one. Two is longer on this side and curls back in the other direction. And three is short and stubby and then you have two claws at the end. And there is a series of hairs here on the outside. And then it goes like, So I'm going to create the overall shape first, and then I will define the edges. Alright, so, swimming leg. <laughs> Super shiny. I love the spotting on the tibia here. I think it's kind of cool. All right. And then we have a hind leg. Now the hind leg where it is wide and very, um, where it's wide and you can tell it would be a, make a really, really good fin or a really great swimming leg. At least it makes more sense to me than the middle leg because the trochanter is at least in the right shape and in the right place. Alright, so I'm going to draw our hind leg here. So the coxa, a lot of times we've been starting with the coxa. The coxa is right here. It's that little, little bitty triangle um, coming out from the bottom. And it might expand. No, it doesn't. Um, it's just this little triangle here. This piece here is the trochanter. This is the femur. This is the tibia. And the tarsal segments are down there. We'll get to them in a moment. So let's go ahead and start up here. We've got this triangle. Dante, is there an insect that you would like to see under a microscope that you haven't that we haven't done yet? Because it'd be cool to get some suggestions. Uh, that's the coxa. This next one is going to be the trochanter. It's kind of this triangular piece. It also helps kind of like a knee because it helps like uh, angle the leg in the right location. Although I am going to shorten it up a little bit. Alrighty. The femur is nice and narrow at the base but gets wider kind of based on this angle here. And then I wanted to see if this tibia is shiny because of hairs or if it's just, nope, it's just shiny. Alright, so starting here, this side is a little bit shorter, the outside's just a little bit longer for our friend. How long is the hind leg compared to the middle leg? Oh, right, because my hind leg is getting really small because it's all I could fit.
A Dobson fly would be fun. When it's swimming, the middle and hind legs barely stick out from below the elytra. Right. So, the, um, neither of them are very long, I think. So, it's kind of hard to tell because the middle leg's all curled up and the hind leg is straight. But they seem that they might be about the same length. And there's a part of me... So, if I use my measurement tool here, it's not going to give me the proper measurements, but it can do like a ratio. I can compare one size to the other size. So let me see. Maybe, maybe this will work. Yeah, they're about the same. And you're right, I think a Dobson fly would be cool, especially the male one because of the giant mandibles. Um, I, I have something that'll work. We're going to do that next week, it's going to be awesome. I'll even write it down for us. Cool. Stag beetles are cool. Um, I have the reddish orange stag and <coughs> another species of stag. I don't know if I've identified it yet. Um, so you're a fan of the big jaws, I hear. <laughs> Season two, nasty, sharp, pointy fangs. Got it. Need more, need more fangs. So I'm trying to see what in the world is happening with these hind tarsal segments. They look really weird. So this first one over here, um, I'm going to put it back, but I was just trying to see. They're very, very flat, and they're very plate-like. And they stick almost on top of one another. Fangs giving. <laughs> You're funny. So if we look at it from here, um, you can see on my sketch it would be the far side where we've got that series of kind of longer hairs here. And then where these hairs are, loop, 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 loop. All right, so you've got this kind of first tarsal segment is here. But then it appears that you also have two more triangular tarsal segments underneath that are setos. They're covered in hair. They're like this. And they kind of wrap a little bit. So you've got two, three, and then... See, I can't tell if there's another small segment with the claws or if the claws come directly out of this bottom one. Because this one is three with claws, I'm going to guess that this one's also three with claws. So they have some similarities, but they're definitely not the same. And then here at the end...
siphon for air. Horns are great too. You know what? I love myself some really great horns. I don't have very many awesome male rhinoceros beetles because I can only find females. Um, I've collected one or two, but I don't have those specimens anymore. I do have some dung beetles, some male dung beetles that have some pretty nifty horns um, in the collection. I don't know if we've done um, one of the dung beetles in a while. There's the Taurus one that has the two really sharp horns. Alright, I'm curious. Is there anywhere else on this... Um, on our uh, Whirligig Beetle that you are curious to seeing, that you want to see again, that you want to see closer. If you find live females, can you capture them um, to attract males? Side view of the eye. I'm going to say probably not. It would be really difficult to be able to attract the males just by putting the females in a cage unless it was the exact right time of the year. So you'd have to have some pretty awesome timing. I guess it's possible but not probable is where my head is. It's cute how the little scarabs have their horns compared to the giant dynasties. Yes! I agree. And, um... Uh, the dynasty species, uh, you are allowed to have now. The dynasties Granti and the dynasties Hercules, you're allowed to have without containment facility permits nowadays. So, that's kind of cool. I'm trying to think about anything else that I have that might have horns, other than, like, the dung beetles. I mean, I have some stag beetles that are really cool. I don't know. I've always thought that looking at longhorn beetle mandibles were really awesome. Um, they're not huge when you look at them from afar, but um, their mandibles are super variable when you look from species to species, and so that's kind of cool. Yeah, with the silk moss it works a lot. It's going to work really well because they only live three to five days. So their entire mission is to mate. Um, the female beetles, I would think that it's a little bit trickier. Longhorn beetles do have delightful feet. You know who else has delightful feet are the uh, chrysomelids, the leaf beetles. Um, they have a they have very very thick series of CD on the bottom of each of their tarsal claws, and it's so cute too. <laughs> the longhorn beetles with their crazy reniform eyes—they look like kidney beans. Oh man, I have uh, Dante. Have you watched the um, the milkweed longhorn beetle? Their compound eyes are crazy because. Their eyes are also divided into fourths, um, except that it's just because the, um, the, the exoskeleton has divided the eyes. Um, what do they call those? Quadrioculatus or something? They, they literally call them four eyes. Let me look it up again. Tetra. 
Tetra Opie's Tetrothalmus. <laughs> Four eyes. I could show you it probably. Let me see if I can pull the specimen really quick. There he is. So this is our friend, the milkweed longhorn bean. Oh. Uh, this is our friend, the milkweed longhorn beetle, and if you look right here, <laughs> the, that black spot right here, so this black spot above the antenna and the black spot below the antenna is both the compound eyes, and then the antenna just comes out right from the middle of the compound eye, <laughs> so they are called four eyes. Right. Well, that's Susan. You get my. You get it exactly. <laughs> Greek or Latin quads and tetras. Well, that's the thing. That's why I was like quadra doesn't sound right, but that would be four. I wonder why it would evolve to them to have them like that. Yep, they evolved independently, completely separately. Two different beetles evolved the ability to have four compound eyes. And I have no idea what would cause, what would trigger them to have compound eyes like that. Or like, why did the antenna have to be right in the middle of the eye? Couldn't they have just moved it up just a little bit so that you could have an entire compound eye? I've always thought that they were really cute, though. Oh, this is awesome. Look, you can see all four eyes. <laughs> when I was a kid, I called these squeaky beetles because they were all over the, uh, they were all over the milkweed, and, um, if you pick them up, they go, they stridulate, they squeak, they go, weak, 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 weak. And so, I always call them squeaky beetles. Alrighty. Does it count as four separate eyes or two eyes that are each split? I don't know if that differentiation matters, but if I was going to, oh, do you mean like their connection to the brain? Because if you mean the connection to the brain, I'm not sure. Um, I would assume that the whirligig beetles are two separate eyes and that the longhorn beetles are eyes that are separated, but I'm not sure why, I don't, I, I don't have any reasoning behind it. That's just what my gut tells me. Milkweed tussock moths are so cool. I've seen them in such large numbers. Do they have an optic nerve? That dives really deep in insect physio, and I haven't actually taken insect physio yet, so I couldn't tell you if, uh, right off the top of my head, if insects have an optic nerve. I wish I could. Milkweed is popular because it is poisonous, and there are many insects that can eat it and become poisonous from it, right? So, like the longhorn beetles and the monarchs um, and the milkweed bugs they all um, drink on the uh, they all drink on the plant and then become poisonous become toxic from it uh, but the insects that are specialized in it can feed on it and everybody else can't 
which also makes it good for those who can because there's significantly less competition, right? Um, they're a specialist feeder, but the plant that they specialize on is toxic for everybody else. Um, that would be in comparison to something like some of the sweat bees or some of our native bees that are, um, that are specialists on one type of flower, whereas um, something like the honeybee can, is a generalist that can pollinate and go to all of the flowers. Um, the milkweed kind of keeps that from happening because it is poisonous. Yes! You should ask him, you should ask that professor and then come back to me and get back to me about it, Susan. Um, because I would be really interested in knowing more about how the insect eye works on like a, a deeper level. Maybe I'll have to find something to read about it. Insect eyesight would be a really cool thing to focus on. Um, alrighty, I think that I'm closing in on the end of the live stream, unless anybody has any other questions, comments, concerns. Awesome. Oh, oh his name is Robert Olberg. He might be retired now. Ooh, maybe I'll have to read some of them. I'll write it down. Robert Olberg. Sight. Cool. Awesome. I just want to say, oh, where'd I go? Oh, there, there I am. All right. Um, I just, ooh, you can see my fan. Very tight. Oh, oh, come on, friend. No. Of course, it's like the minute I decide to touch it. There we are. Stay. Perfect. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this was Trisha with Insectopia. I really um, am glad that you decided to join us today and hang out and look and t look at this whirly gig beetle, talk about it, draw it a little bit. Um, I love, love, love hearing from new friends out there, especially those who have gained a better appreciation or have... Um, or have, have come to love looking at insects even closer because we get to zoom in and check them out and draw them together. Um, if you know anybody who is school age, I do teach out school. It's for 5 to 8, 9 to 12. And I do have some teenagers now, nowadays coming into class um, for kind of an introduction to college entomology, kind of high school prep college entomology class. It's a lot of fun. We I enjoy it a lot. Um, over here is where is to remind you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Down on the bottom right um, is a little QR code that will bring you to my donation. If you really enjoyed hanging out with me today and you'd like to um, donate a couple dollars to Insectopia, that's where you can do it. You can also find the uh, link in the description box below. Um, yay! <laughs> Watch where I step to, of course. Yes, of course, Dante. Um, keep in mind, if you want to share your sketch with me, I have my email address, which is trisha at theinsectopia.com, and I love to see everybody's sketches and blog posts and um, art that they've created based on our live streams here together. Um, and if you want to find me on Facebook or Instagram, I am at insectopia2015. Have an absolutely lovely rest of your week, and stay buggy! Bye.